Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome once again to the weekly UCT um, COVID webinar. Uh, I'm Mark Sondrop, together with Wendy Spearman. It's our pleasure to welcome you yet again. Thank you for joining for this hour. We're again grateful to Project ECHO, University of New Mexico, that uh, in fact has extended their license to allow us today to have this webinar and uh, it's looking good because the license has allowed us to extend up to a thousand people and we seem to be approaching that mark uh, at this point in time. We'll be handing over to Graham to take over the rest of the meeting shortly. Um, just two housekeeping points. You all are being muted on entry. Uh, the panelists will be unmuted as the meeting progresses. Uh, we had an issue in week two with people hacking the meeting and thus we disabled the chat function. We're going to open up the chat function in the second half of the meeting to allow people to direct questions to the host only and we will pass those on to Professor Mankies to in fact um, take over and deal with. So over to you Graham and thank you once again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks very much Mark. Um, and welcome to everyone to uh, this week's COVID-19 ECHO Clinic webinar hosted by the Department of Medicine. I'm Graham Mankis. Um, and we've now developed a, a standard format, which is uh, that we have a, a brief update from the Western Cape Department of Health regarding the surveillance in the Western Cape. Uh, and then we have our main talk, uh, which should be around 25 minutes. Uh, and then we have a panel uh, who will address questions and engage in discussion with uh, the main speaker. Um, so our first uh, speaker uh, is Marianne Davies from the Western Cape Department of Health as well as the UCT School of Public Health and Marianne's going to give us a, a brief update on the surveillance of the epidemic in our province. So over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, again for the invitation. Um, I think those who've been on these webinars are, are getting used to the tag team that Andrew and I do. Um, I think if we can just put it, oh, we seem to have the wrong slides, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that Andrew and I are doing in terms of giving a, a brief update and the focus for today's talk um, towards the end of the talk is going to be on uh, the prevalence of comorbidities that we're seeing in our patients based on the linked data between COVID and the existing data in the Provincial Health Data Center. You can move to the next slide. I think um, those of you who've been on a couple of these calls are used to the fact that Andrew and I tend to refer back to Professor Karim's uh, three epidemics, the import, imported in blue, import associated in red, and the local transmission in green. And two weeks ago, when I last did this talk, I showed you the picture on the left, and I said we'd now entered our exponential phase. Uh, mm. At that stage, we were getting a maximum of 80 new cases a day. If you look at us now on the 5th of May on the far right, we are getting in the order of 350 cases a day. And if we had to plot that 21st of April graph, back down to, with the vertical axis going up to 350, you can see that what we were getting so excited about until then is absolutely dwarfed by the numbers that we are seeing now. Uh, the black arrow shows where we were two weeks ago, and so we certainly are entering the exponential phase of the epidemic. And if you move to the next slide, I'm sure uh, most people on the call are aware that we are in the unenviable position of leading the COVID race. Uh, more than twice as many cases at uh, well over 3,300. It's actually even more than that today. Um, and also leading the death race, uh, almost double the number of deaths of any other province. Um, and I'm sure all of you are asking the question about why, why things seem to be so much worse in the Western Cape. And that's certainly a question we're asking ourselves if there's time, perhaps we can have some discussion after that. You can move to the next slide. So one of the things I wanted to focus on is the age distribution um, of the cases that we have found. And you can see that it's very much a younger population and actually with a female predominance. And that's because a lot of the cases are coming from these workplace clusters. You've probably seen in the news about the uh, supposedly unsafe pharma factory, which tested the entire factory and found 50% of their workforce 
was, or not the entire factory, but the entire shifts of the factory and found that 50% of the workforce was positive and 30% of those in these workplace clusters had no symptoms at the time of testing. Because of this uh, age and sex distribution with particularly retail sector and, and those remaining in the manufacturing sector that have been open, we've got a predominance of women and to date we have 33 pregnant women who've been diagnosed with COVID and 26 mothers who delivered in the six months before they had COVID. Perhaps of more relevance to the pediatricians, but just a, a growing population of pregnant and breastfeeding women um, exposed with COVID. You can move to the next slide. Um, this is looking at the detected cases in incidents per million. Um, and you can see here that uh, Kailicha and Western Subdistrict are, are leading the race. And this has been a shift very much from early on in the epidemic where it was uh, southern um, and to some extent the wealthy areas in Western were, uh, had, had the highest numbers of cases. This has now shifted and we've definitely seen the epidemic moving to the east and in Western it is the poorer informal settlements where we are seeing cases but really spread quite widely across the metro. So it's hard to say that it's in this particular sub-district that we see cases because we see cases pretty much in all areas. Move to the next slide. Uh, and this is just a quick update on the testing. Uh, our testing continues to ramp up, particularly the public sector testing shown in green and the community screening and testing is shown in the dark green bars. We hit a record of, um, I think about more than 3,500 tests uh, per day last week. And if you look at the proportion positive on the bottom graph, you can see that overall in the black line, it's climbing. Um, in our public sector non-CST tests, which are the light green line, that we have the highest uh, proportion positive, over 15%. And the CST and uh, pub, uh, private sector tests are both sitting at just below uh, 10%. If, if we um, look at the CST positives, what does that tell us about how many people are actually infected in the Western Cape? Well, around five or six percent of 7,000 who were symptomatic of, uh, at this stage, 200,000 people who had been screened gives a proportion positive of about 0.175 percent, and that accounts to about 12,000 people infected. get better but in fact it's probably got worse and we now have about four in five patients who present at the time of admission or afterwards or sorry who are diagnosed at the time of admission or afterwards so suggesting that we are under detecting cases in the community. You can also see there the number of tests per 10,000 in adults and for different groups of children uh, about uh, four or five times higher proportion of testing in, in adults move to the next slide. So I think those of you who are working in clinical services probably know this, but um, just to look at the proportion of patients with comorbidities, and we're looking here at diabetes, hypertension, or both of those together, and looking by age group, and uh, as we expect, as we move to the older age groups, we have a greater proportion of patients with those conditions and those conditions are much more prevalent in those who are admitted on the right hand side compared to those who are not admitted and particularly the combination of both diabetes and hypertension and any of these in nearly 50% uh, of patients and you can see the crude case fatality rates for those different comorbidities. I'll highlight that this is based really only on the public sector cases where we have this information already enumerated in our provincial health data and that particularly for hypertension, the algorithms that we use to identify patients with hypertension are probably uh, not as opt optimal as they could be. So there may be some under ascertainment there. And then the next slide. 
and then this is looking at HIV. So we've had a total of 352 uh, COVID and HIV co-infected patients. Um, and in keeping with our population numbers in those young uh, working age groups, we've seen high, relatively high proportions, I think, of people with HIV, although probably not that different to the population. Um, based on the most recent viral load, uh, what's uh, promising is that 93% of them are virally suppressed, but among the nine deaths that we've seen so far in people living with HIV, four of them actually had a low CD4 count, and some of those were um, virally suppressed. If you look on the right-hand top graph, you can see that the proportion with HIV among admissions is higher than among non-admissions, and then importantly, in the bottom right graph, just to show that people with HIV also have other comorbidities, and particularly in the older age groups with HIV, really similarly up to half who either have diabetes or hypertension. And uh, that's all I've got for this week, but watch the space for the next instalment. Thanks very much, Marianne. That's great, a really great overview of the, the issues. Uh, can I just ask one question about the community testing? At, at how many sites uh, in the Western Cape is, is community testing now happening and, and roughly how many people are being tested at, at, those, at those individual sites? So the process is a screen and test. Um, so the screening is for symptoms and then people are tested. In terms of the sites, they, they move um, from area to area, but within each sub-district, there usually are about two teams per day. And overall, um, on average for the province, we are screening between 20 to 30,000 people a day for symptoms. And in the metro, about 10% of those are symptomatic and then are sent for testing. Uh, in rural, it's much, much lower. Um, the, the overall numbers are, are still very high in terms of the number of people screened, but only about 0.5 of a percent are symptomatic and sent for testing. So to date, we have screened um, uh, close to 300,000 people, actually, uh, not, not on the weekends, but yeah, the, the daily sort of 20 to 30,000 a day. Great. Thanks very much, and I really appreciate the, the updates from you and Andrew each week. Um, so we, we're going to move on to our main talk uh, for this afternoon and I'm very excited and, and I've been really looking forward to this talk uh, that's going to be given by uh, my colleague at, at UCT, Greg Caligara, um, and is going to address probably one of the clinical issues that is, is most novel about uh, COVID uh, and that's how it differs uh, from other forms of pneumonia and ARDS. Uh, in terms of pathophysiology and in terms of, of uh, clinical presentation and, and clinical progression and what the implications of, the, of that are for, for management. Uh, so just to introduce uh, Greg, uh, Greg is a, a respiratory physician and a, and a critical care specialist uh, from the Division of Pulmonology at UCT and, and at Kuriskia Hospital. And he's also a, a researcher based in the Center for Lung Infection and Immunity at UCT's Lung Institute. Um, he's uh, the medical director of the uh, thoracic transplant program at UCT and has helped to establish uh, ECMO services at Kurdiskia Hospital. Um, so Greg's uh, talk is entitled, What is Different About the Pneumonia Due to SARS-CoV-2? So thanks very much, Greg. I really appreciate uh, the, the, the time that you've taken to put together this talk. And I think everybody's excited to hear the talk today. And I think it's a, it's a really cutting edge issue. Thanks. Thanks, Graham, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak today. I just need to go back to the very first slide. Um, as you said, this is quite a controversial topic, um, and um, the, the new data is evolving kind of on a, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's also a pretty big topic, so I've decided to limit myself to an agenda which I'm going to outline. Um, I'm going to review how SARS-CoV-2 infects and affects the lung. Um, I also want to... Um, describe how, sorry, I'm having a problem with advancing my animations. It seems very slow. Okay, I want to describe the respiratory symptoms and the radiological characteristics. I also want to, sorry, I'm really having a problem. I'm just getting the, sp the spinning wheel for advancing my animations. Okay, and I, th I'm, 
I'm going to review some important, what I think is important respiratory physiology, um, which is obviously not the bread and butter of uh, people other than respiratory physicians and intensivists for understanding the pathogenesis of COVID-19 acute lung injury. I'm going to describe the evolution of respiratory failure and COVID pneumonia. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about some potential interventions that we can do to try and arrest this process. Um, importantly, and I think controversially, I'm going to introduce the concept of COVID ARDS, um, which some authors have termed as CARDS, which is a temporal spectrum with two primary phenotypes, obviously with a large degree of overlap between patients. Um, and then, as I said, I'm going to just talk about some interventions. What I'm not going to talk about, Mark, I wonder if it's easier if you just advance for me. Um, is I'm not going to talk about pharmacological management of COVID pneumonia, and I'm also not going to talk about the nuts and bolts of specific ventilatory and uh, ICU protocols related to the care of uh, these critically ill patients. All right, so the um, famous uh, art of war by Sun Tzu speaks about knowing thy enemy, and I think by now we all recognize that graphic on the right-hand side. I mean, on the left-hand side, that's one of that's uh, SARS-CoV-2, one of the beta coronaviruses. It's a positive single-stranded uh, RNA virus, and it derives its name from these um, projections on the surface of the virus, which give it a crown-like appearance, hence the word corona. It's a zoonosis, um, thought to originate from bats, and its siblings are SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, which have a different clinical uh, severity and outcome, but also have respiratory involvement. And then just for the purposes of definition, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus, but we talk about the disease as being COVID-19. Right, so the pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 starts with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its attachment to airway epithelial cells, um, primarily using the spike protein, which is in its membrane complex, and attaching to the ACE2 receptor on epithelial cells. The virus gets internalized, it takes over the, or it hijacks the cellular machinery, um, uh, replicating itself and, uh, and, and translating the proteins required for its capsule. Um, but this unchecked viral replication inside the cell uh, gives rise to a process called pyroptosis, which is a highly inflammatory form of programmed cell death that occurs um, with infection with an intracellular pathogen. Um, and the uh, shockwave or the, or the detritus from, from this um, event is that there's the release of damage associated molecular patterns, nucleic acids and other molecules, um, which are recognized by neighboring epithelial cells, endothelial cells and alveolar macrophages, and this activates the innate immunity. Um, there's a generation of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, of which we know IL-6 is an important one, and that attracts neutrophils, uh, T cells and macrophages to the sites of infection and T cells make interferon gamma and that perpetuates the positive cycle of inflammation. So what happens next? Well, if you're lucky, um, it's uh, what's depicted in the cartoon on the right hand side, which is that um, you develop adaptive immunity with viral specific T cells and neutralizing antibodies. Um, your alveolar macrophages are activated to clear up the apoptotic cells and all the viral debris and the damage is limited and the airway epithelium recovers. But in some patients, we get the cartoon on the left. With the inflammatory response snowballs, there's further accumulation of immune cells and there's destruction of the alveolar barrier with transudation of inflammatory mediators and fluid into the alveolar space. Of course, that impacts on gas exchange. Um, and the cytokine storm can spill out from the lung to other organs and cause multi-organ failure. So people have proposed that there are different phases of the infection and that there's a pathological correlate for each of them. Um, and what we start off with is stage one, which involves inoculation and early establishment of the disease. And virologically, this is when SARS-CoV-2 is multiplying and establishing residence in the host. Clinically, um, symptoms are usually quite mild. There's malaise, there's fever. Um, upper respiratory symptoms may predominate, and we know that an anosmia is an important early sentinel uh, symptom. And as you progress to stage two, the pulmonary phase, um, there's localized inflammation in the lung um, with the development of significant interstitial edema and then gas exchange abnormalities. Clinically, this is correlated with the development of a cough um, and possibly 
alterations in, in uh, gaseous exchange. And this is usually the stage where patients need to be admitted and, and require supplemental oxygen. A minority of patients will go on to a hyperinflammatory phase, which is really the third and most serious stage of the illness. And this manifests as an extra pulmonary systemic hyperinflammatory syndrome. Um, all the markers of inflammation that we know uh, as poor prognostic markers in COVID are, are raised. IL-6, D-dimer, troponins, uh, markers of uh, right atrial stretch like internal pro-BNP. Uh, pro um, and there's a, a myriad of extra pulmonary manifestations of which myocarditis is important, hematological uh, things like hemophagocytosis, and there can be loss of vascular tone, vasoplegia, and even cardiovascular collapse. And, of course, as we know, overall, the prognosis and recovery from this critical stage of the illness is, is quite poor. Um, I'm going to skip through that slide, which uh, talks about the same kind of temporal progression um, and uh, talk about um, what we know the clinical presentation of COVID pneumonia to be. And I'm reviewing two articles here, both of which describe two large case series. The first one is one of the early reports from Wuhan which looked at 138 hospitalized patients. And I think it's important to stress that they all had radiological abnormalities of uh, presumed viral pneumonia. These, these are all COVID positive cases. Um, and I think it's interesting that only a third, even though they were all hospitalized, complained of shortness of breath. And this is a symptom which only developed a median of about five days after the onset of symptoms. The majority of patients had a dry cough. And, and I think we all recognize that that is a prototypical uh, presentation. But it's interesting that up, up to 30% had cough with sputum production. So certainly the presence of a productive cough is not a negative predictor uh, in the clinical algorithm of, of COVID-19. Um, of the patients, 20% developed respiratory failure, and this happened at a median of day eight after the onset of symptoms, and 12 required mechanical ventilation. Okay, to contrast this, this is the New York experience, much bigger group. 5,700 patients, also all hospitalized. Um, the majority were not tachypneic, 17% um, only had a respiratory rate more than 24. But interestingly, despite the different settings, the same amount of patients or the same proportion, 20% developed respiratory failure, and 12% again required uh, mechanical ventilation. And I think the overall mortality in this group has been very well publicized because it's extremely high at 88%. Moving on to the radiological features, again, the timing is important. I'm going to show you a few CT slices which are from different patients but represent different phases in the evolution of the disease. Okay, so the early scan, so this is at day three, these are all off, uh, days after onset of symptoms, shows bilateral but focal ground glass opacities with quite smooth interlobular and intralobular septal thickening, and mainly in the lower lobes. In this case series, 10% um, of, uh, of uh, abnormalities were unilateral. And in the elderly, um, the, the radiological findings were thought to be more consolidation superimposed on ground glass. As the disease evolves, um, there is a progressive increase in the size and number of the alveolar um, uh, ground glass opacities, and then secondary consolidation. Sorry, Mark, I've lost, uh, I've lost control of the slides again. Someone can just advance the slide for me. There we go. Um, and the peak severity radiologically happens at about day 10. And on day 17, which is uh, well within the recovery phase, there's really just a, a, a waning of those opacities and the development of more fibrotic reticular bands uh, in the sites where there were more ground glass opacities. Okay, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, all right, so how does this respiratory presentation of COVID-19 compare with the other forms of viral pneumonia that we know? And this is a study, uh, a recent study also from China, which was a retrospective cohort uh, case control study, and it compared the presentation of COVID to the other pandemic respiratory viral epidemic of our lifetime, H1N1 influenza. And compared to patients with H1N1 influenza, COVID-19 patients had more dry cough and less upper respiratory tract involvement, so less rhinorrhea. Um, I think um, most clinicians have an impression that uh, influenza presents in a shorter time frame uh, with respiratory failure developing earlier on than with COVID. 
But actually, the study didn't find that, and they found that there was an equivalent time to the onset of ARDS of about eight days from symptom onset. There were more ground glass opacities with COVID, uh, better oxygenation, um, but lower severity of illness scores, and overall a lower uh, mortality when adjusted for the severity of their organ failure. Okay, so, um, so that's got the um, uh, clinical and radiological data out of the way. And I'd like to briefly revise two concepts that I'm sure you all remember, but I think that we're going to need when we discuss the development of respiratory failure and ARDS in COVID. The first one is ventilation perfusion matching. And a related concept is that of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So when we talk about VQ balance or VQ matching, um, there is an understanding that optimal gas exchange in the lung occurs when regions are ventilated in proportion to their perfusion. And when the, ra when the ratio of ventilation to perfusion is equal, we say the VQ ratio is one. So that's the middle alveolus. It's got excellent ventilation and excellent perfusion. But if you've got uneven distribution of both perfusion or ventilation, okay, then that causes abnormalities in gas exchange. And we've got two extremes. The first one, where lung unit is perfused, but not ventilated. And what this means is that mixed venous blood enters the lung, does not see a gas exchange surface, and returns to the systemic circulation without being oxygenated. Okay, we call this venous admixture, and it mixes with oxygenated blood to drop the partial pressure of oxygen in blood that reaches the systemic circulation. The other uh, extreme is that uh, where we have ventilation in excess of perfusion. Okay, so this is, uh, results in inefficient ventilation because you've got a part of your tidal volume that doesn't take part in gas exchange, but it has a much lesser effect on hypoxemia. And this is called dead space ventilation. My next slide is quite a complicated one and I don't want to discuss it in detail, but I've put it in to show that there are regional differences in ventilation and perfusion which are dependent on the position of the lungs in the chest wall and are also modified by gravity. And this is obviously going to become important because we're going to talk in a few slides on how positioning the patient can change oxygenation. Um, speaking specifically to perfusion, the pulmonary circulation is a low pressure circulation, so gravity has a substantial effect on fluid pressure. So unsurprisingly, the distribution of blood throughout the lungs is uneven and generally the dorsal areas, so up against the spine and the bases are better perfused. Ventilation also varies according to position because the weight of the lung becomes important. I mean, it's, the lung is a sponge, um, but the bottom parts of it are gonna be heavier and heavy lung is more compliant and the more non-dependent lung uh, receives more ventilation and becomes more dis distended. So, if we talk about supine patients, we've got better perfusion at the base, okay, so that's against the spine, but the ventral or the lung units underneath the sternum are better ventilated. So there's an intrinsic imbalance in ventilation and perfusion matching in a supine patient. Okay, next slide. Um, all right, the next concept we have to talk about is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is a reflex, it's a homeostatic mechanism whereby small pulmonary arteries vasoconstrict in the presence of hypoxia to redirect blood to well-ventilated units. So it makes no sense to have blood go to an alveolus that isn't ventilated. So you can see here in the, in the left sided cartoon, there are two alveoli, one which has got a, um, an impairment in its ventilation, and if blood goes to that alveolus and doesn't get oxygenated, it contributes to the shunt. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is an intrinsic property of pulmonary vascular endothelium. So it's a locally mediated effect. And it's the primary mechanism whereby we try and correct VQ imbalance in the lung and match blood flow regionally to increase the overall efficiency of gas exchange. And this is a critical measure to maintain oxygenation in patients with pulmonary pathology. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is happening all the time in your lung, depending on your position, depending on your pathology, um, and depending on the state of your alveolar. Okay, so how does this translate to um, the clinical scenario? 
Well, acute respiratory distress syndrome is a pathology that preferentially affects the dependent portions of the lung. So the, the dorsal alveoli, the ones against the, the back, are consolidated and collapsed. I've already explained that these um, areas have got more perfusion and ventilation then is directed towards the non-dependent ventral areas where the alveoli are often overexpanded. And so what you set up is a perfect scenario for shunt because you've got non-ventilated basal units that have got more blood supply. So the next question is, if this is ARDS, is viral pneumonia ARDS? So the consensus definition for ARDS is called the Berlin definition, and it defines ARDS as a pathology of acute onset with bilateral opacities on radiology um, with edema of the lung, which is not explained by a cardiogenic or fluid overload cause, and which is associated with severe impairments in gas exchange, as defined by the PF ratio. All right, so now I'm going to give you two examples, two case studies of patients with COVID pneumonia, and we're going to see how they fall onto the spectrum of VQ balance. Okay, so the first of these is a, a patient that you may, um, whose pathology you may well recognize from, from um, conventional ARDS. So this, the CT scan is shown on the left-hand side. You can see that there's considerable pulmonary pathology. There's um, consolidation and collapse of the lower lobes, um, oh, sorry, of the dependent parts of the lung with um, aeration and ground glass opacities in the more ventral areas. The bar graph on the right-hand side is a quantitative representation of the Hounsfield units in that scan. Okay. So the lower Hounsfield units are, represent more aerated lung and they are shown by blue bar graphs, and the more consolidated fluid-containing lung is represented by the red bar graphs. So what you can see is a lung where the, the distribution is shifted towards the non-aerated component. And unsurprisingly, this patient is mechanically ventilated, they've got a high FiO2, and they are severely hypoxic with a PF ratio of less than 100, which you'll recall from that Berlin definition means that they've got severe ARDS. So this is one presentation of COVID pneumonia. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the person who's got a CT scan with few pulmonary opacities, as evidenced by the quantitative HRCT, which shows that most of the volume of the lung is contained in the blue bar graphs, okay, so aerated lung. This patient also has a very high oxygen requirement, an FiO2 of 80%, and a PF ratio also of less than 100. So how do we explain these two very different presentations, but with equally severe hypoxia? Now, when you've got a dissociation between the level of hypoxemia and the opacities visible on radiology or the amount of lung tissue that's involved, you must invoke a problem with the pulmonary vasculature. And the proposition is that COVID uh, pneumonia has got a potent effect on obliterating the normal homeostatic reflex of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So this means that even when patients have got little in the way of pulmonary opacities, the shunting of blood flow that occurs through those areas is in way in excess of what it should be. And that means that blood is not getting in contact with the gas exchange membrane, and that results in systemic hypoxemia. And this has been demonstrated by investigators who have shown that the shunt fraction in these patients is very high. So it may be ARDS, uh, in the words of another doctor, Dr. Spock, but not as we know it. Um, so, so Luciana Gattanoni, who's one of the real doyens of, of the ARDS literature, has proposed that what we're dealing with is a spectrum of disease between two different phenotypes. So obviously this doesn't, um, this doesn't um, mean that patients only exist in one of those two states. There's a considerable area of overlap. But the first phenotype is something that we understand well. It's the conventional ARDS with a very non-compliant lung that is boggy because of edema, a high shunt through the edematous basal um, collapsed atelectatic segments, as I showed you in the graph earlier, a high lung weight, but also a high lung recruitability because the application of uh, positive end expiratory pressure is able to open those collapsed dependent units. But that within the spectrum of CARDS or COVID ARDS, there's another phenotype, the so-called type L, which happens early in presentation, where the, the respiratory mechanics are unaltered. The pulmonary parenchymal 
um, involvement is minimal, but there's still severe abnormalities in VQ mismatching with a very low VQ because of loss of hypo hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. These patients' lung weights are low, so they're not edematous, and the lungs are poorly recruitable. In other words, oxygenation does not improve with the application of positive uh, end expiratory pressure because the lungs are mainly well aerated in any way, any case. Now, of course, deciding which phenotype these patients fit into uh, requires a CT scan, which in our setting has got uh, logistical and IPC concerns. Um, but these authors have, have said that within a, uh, the context of a ventilated patient, you can estimate um, the compliance of the lung based on how easy it is to ventilate them and whether you're able to recruit them with the application of PEEP. All right, I'm going to digress slightly here because I just want to talk about ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, just to remind you that patients with sick lungs are not only at risk because of the pathological effects of the disease, but also by the harmful effects of their treating modalities. And in particular, positive pressure uh, ventilation can be harmful to the lung. We know that the lung could be damaged by, by volume. We know that it can be damaged by uh, atelector trauma, which is the repeated opening and closing of lung units. Um, and we know that it can be damaged by high pressure. Um, and this can perpetuate the cycle of inflammation um, that drives ARDS. Sorry, I'm still struggling with advancing here. In fact, um, uh, there's, you know, rather than consider each of these individual forces as potentially pathogenic on the lung, um, it's now understood that it's not positive pressure per se, but it's all these forces that apply mechanical power to the lung. So volume, pressure, rate, and flow, which uh, contribute to a single physical entity, that of mechanical power. And that's what causes damage to the lung. And that's uh, referred to as ergotrauma. Now, applying excessive mechanical power is not only something that happens in um, mechanical ventilation, it can happen in spontaneous breathing too. High tidal volume, rapid breathing efforts generate very negative intrapleural pressures. And this contributes to a very large um, transpulmonary gradient, which isn't equally distributed across the lung, but it's localized in the dependent portions of the lung. And that's also where the action of the diaphragm is, is strongest. Sorry, I'm... Okay, so there we go. Um, so this means, if I can just try and advance some things, but basically what happens is that um, you can see that these very negative pleural pressures um, affect the dorsal lung more because the dorsal lung is solid, so it doesn't allow the transmission of the stresses and strains that happen with ventilation. Um, and and we, there's, there's indirect evidence for what spontaneous breathing can do to a sick lung because we know that if we paralyze somebody, okay, now paralysis in ICU comes with its own set of problems, but from a respiratory mechanics point of view, if you paralyze somebody and you reduce the transpulmonary gradient, there's a reduction in the inflammatory markers of both endothelial and epithelial um, damage. And also uh, on the clinical front, we know that neuromuscular blockade is associated with increased survival in patients with severe ARDS. So um, there's this concept of patient self-inflicted lung injury, which is what happens when you've got sick lungs, uh, collapsed lung units, and very vigorous uh, uh, breaths, usually of high tidal volume and that are rapid, which apply a large amount of mechanical power to the lung and can cause biotrauma in the same way that mechanical ventilation can. I can have the next slide, please. Now, um, this entity of, of, of p silly or patient self-induced lung injury, um, this highly negative pressure is also transmitted to the pulmonary vasculature, which causes exaggerated distension of the pulmonary vessels during inspiration. Um, so when you have very negative intrathoracic pressures, you also distend your, um, your, your pulmonary arteries, as shown in this graph on the right-hand side. The sucks fluid in the chest. And if you've got a pathology like with COVID that has got a vasogenic component, then you have increased exudation of fluid into the lungs uh, via a hydrostatic mechanism. Okay, so to put it all together, if we accept that the primary drivers of pneumonia in COVID or CARDS 
is dysregulation of the pulmonary vasculature and interstitial edema, okay? But with the prominent vascular component allowing a severe shunt, which results in severe hypoxia, okay? That drives tachypnea, high minute ventilation, and very negative intrapleural pressures. And this leads to the entity of either patient self-induced lung injury in a spontaneously breathing patient or ventilator-induced lung injury in somebody who's breathing spontaneously on a ventilator. Now, these are not phenomena that are unique to COVID pneumonia, but what is unique is that this vessel stretch and increased perfusion hydrostatic edema um, is a direct result of the vasoplegic effects of COVID on the pulmonary vasculature. And this then feeds towards the shunt, feeds towards the hypoxia, and leads to the development of what some authors have called a villi vortex, okay, a, a, a downward spiral of worsening hypoxemia, stronger respiratory effort, and worsening alveolar edema. Adding to that the cytokine storm that I described earlier in the pathogenesis of COVID pneumonia and the resultant exudative edema, diffuse alveolar damage with hyaline membranes, proliferation of fibroblasts, and even possibly a thrombotic microangiopathy, which I'll talk about later, and you end up with a severe exudative ARDS, as, as, as we know. And, and possibly we can see why it becomes much harder to reverse the pathology at, at that point. Okay, next slide, please. So what about prone positioning? Next slide. I think an exhaustive discussion of the physiology of proning is, is beyond the, the, the scope of this talk. And I think it, um, how proning really works is something that is incompletely understood. But I th in summary, the weight of the lungs, especially when they are edematous, result in the dependent and more numerous basal alveoli to be compressed in the supine position. So because the lungs are conical, in the prone position, sorry, can we just go back one? They suspended from their base. Okay, and as you can see in the cartoon on the right, this almost stretches the lungs out and results in a redistribution of ventilation, in part through gravitational effects and also because there's size matching between the chest wall and the lung. Okay, this causes more uh, diffuse and homogeneous lung aeration and the strain, the mechanical power that I spoke about earlier is more homogeneously distributed through the lung. Next slide, please. Okay, so I won't go through these in, all, uh, in detail, but just to say there's several other mechanisms um, how proning might work. Um, it shifts weight of the mediastinal contents anteriorly, um, you reduce atelectasis, you increase um, your lung FRC, um, and you facilitate draining of secretions. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is just a slide showing how uh, proning improves oxygenation. This is an early study. Um, and this is when patients were proned on, on uh, alternate days, and you can see that oxygenation improves dramatically. Next slide. Um, and it's unsurprising that if we understand, oh, this is just a, the, the, the very sentinel perceiver study that showed that patients in the prone uh, group um, were, that were randomized to 16 hours of proning were in, in patients with severe ARDS, a PF ratio less than 150, um, had a much lower 90-day mortality. Next slide. Um, and it's unsurprising that people have thought to employ this strategy in, in spontaneously breathing patients. And you can see the graph on the right-hand side shows that um, there is uh, the same uh, improvements in oxygenation uh, in patients that are prone. All right, so it's becoming, it's, it's entered uh, several protocols. Next slide. Okay, so the therapeutic interventions are around breaking the villi vortex, uh, reversing the hypoxemia with the administration of supplemental oxygen. Um, consider awake proning, which will improve VQ in patients that have got atelectasis, but might also reduce the drivers of, of P. cilli. Next slide. Um, what about early intubation? Well, I think we'll leave that for the discussion, and I won't uh, go into the... Uh, um, uh, the discussion on, on the heart. Okay. So suffice to say that this is a data from very few studies. In fact, it's a, from a letter to the editor and 150 patients, which was talked about in an editorial. Uh, next slide. So although um, uh, these are the, the demigods of respiratory physiology, I think we're going to wait more data. And here's a study from the mass gen, which shows uh, a much lower mortality, and they couldn't demonstrate that L phenotype 
um, that, I, that I explained earlier. Next slide. So um, I'll skip these slides on coagulation and COVID, I think in the interest of time, Mark. So just to, just to um, end off, I think COVID pneumonia is a disease with a vascular and an endothelial injury. The hypoxemia is initially disproportionate to the dyspnea and also to the radiological abnormalities. Um, there's a controversial but interesting uh, proposed phenotype with degrees of overlap and early intervention with oxygen and PEEP may ameliorate progression, but um, the progression to mechanical ventilation is usually associated with, with, with poor outcome and there have been variable reports. Right, so I apologize for the problems in advancing. Um, that's the end of my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Th thanks very much, Greg. That was a fantastic overview. I think it's a a very complex topic of evolving information and data and opinion, but you've uh, really described uh, the issues with, with great clarity and, and I think made it very accessible to, to all of us uh, non-respiratory physicians. So, so thanks very much, that's great. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna get, move on to the panel and I'm gonna introduce the panel members one by one and ask them if they want to make one or two comments and, and uh, address questions to Greg. So. Uh, uh, first off is, is Jenna Piercy. Jenna is an anaesthetist and critical care specialist working at uh, Hurdes Clear Hospital. Uh, so Jenna, are you online? Probably just being unmuted. Mark? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Jenna. Okay, yeah. hi. Hi, thanks, Graham. Thanks for inviting me to take part in the discussion. And Greg, thank you for a world-class lecture. That was superb. Um, so I think just a, a, a bit of a comment and maybe a question to Greg that I don't know that he's going to be able to answer, but it's something that we're all thinking about. It's probably a bit too simplistic to um, split this COVID or CARDS into... Um, two specific phenotypes, the L phenotype and the H phenotype, because for eight or nine years now, it's been described that there's probably a five or six different phenotypes of ARDS, and that is probably why a blanket treatment for ARDS has, been, has failed, because it's a very heterogeneous um, disease. So Greg, just in terms of the H and L phenotype, I quite like it because it does keep things simple. But to my knowledge, there's no evidence to support the fact that um, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction fails in, in CARDS. And if this is true, why should this be different in, in COVID-19 than other viral pneumonias? Well, Jenna, you did say it was going to be a difficult question, so I'll, uh, I'll take it. But um, I mean, I think the key points are that um, this is data from one group, but it does show that there is a big discrepancy between the lung compliance or the respiratory mechanics and the degree of hypoxia. And I mean, you know, in the same way that we look at a clear chest x-ray and diagnose pulmonary embolism, um, there seems to be a vascular component which still needs to be studied. And you're right. Um, the, the, the cytopathic effects of virus on the, on the pulmonary endothelium haven't been uh, demonstrated at histological level. I mean, what they have shown, um, and this is again, not completely specific to COVID pneumonia, but that when you do have problems with, um, uh, vascular endothelial involvement, there are a bunch of circulating uh, mediators of, of vascular endothelial injury which you can detect. And, and that's something which I think is the next uh, era of study. Um, in terms of differentiating between the two types, um, I think it's, it's difficult. Um, we don't, um, it's, very, it's very easy when you can uh, take patients down and do quantitative HRCTs and me measure, measure static compliance on them every day, which is not something that we do routinely. Um, but I think it's just important to think about the fact that leaving hypoxic patients with very high respiratory drives to breathe on their own is something that can perpetuate a cycle that causes acute lung injury. And, and I think for me, that's a concept that I've only really appreciated recently. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that mechanical ventilation is the answer for those patients, but an intervention 
uh, possibly high flow nasal cannula uh, oxygen, possibly CPAP that can try and, and break that cycle. I mean, I think the concept of the villi vortex, the, you know, the conditions that exist that it will exacerbate lung injury in somebody who's struggling on their own and generating these, you know, this, this mechanical power across the lung, I think is something that, that's going to need to be explored further. Okay. Sure I, sorry, sorry, Graham. Sorry, Janet. I just wanted to come in there, Greg, and ask you, I mean, even just anecdotal reports of patients being put onto CPAP and uh, non-invasive high-flow nasal oxygen, it, is, there, is there a sense that that can break this, this vortex of villi? Has is, is that been reported? Yes. Or yeah. so, so, you must remember that high-flow nasal cannulae is, is really just the administration of humidified oxygen at high concentrations. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the real advantage is that you can give high concentrations at a high flow and, 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 it's, and it's humidified, so it's well tolerated by patients. But because it's such high flow, it also provides a degree of positive pressure, probably the equivalent of four to five centimeters of water. Mm -hmm. So if you think of that uh, composite slide that I had of the pathogenesis, the, the, the theory is that it can relieve hypoxia, which will reduce respiratory drive. If you are more in the L type, your drive for, for, for ventilation is coming only from your hypoxia. It's not coming from um, uh, alters, alterations in chest wall compliance because of, of pulmonary involvement. So you're mm -hmm. interrupting hypoxia and you are administering a bit of positive pressure to open atelectatic lung units. I mean, one of the, the drawbacks of this theory for me is that it's always been shown in patients that are in bed, which are either supinal prone. But the patients that we see that have got respiratory distress from COVID in, in our wards are, are not lying down, either on their stomachs or on their backs. They're usually sitting up. So, so what, some of the effects of proning might just be um, the, the redistribution of, of forces um, in, in somebody that's, that's very sick, who's in bed and who's got, uh, you know, who's got some, some atelectatic lung units. And it might just be, I mean, as you know, the, the protocol is for two hourly turnings in COVID. And it might just be that the rotation around, you know, moves tissue fluid around, might just improve local VEQ relationships for that short time. And then, you know, um, the gravitational forces are, are switched over to another position. Jenna, sorry, I interrupted you. Did you, did you want to come in? No, 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 Greg, just, on, just with that, I mean, I, I think that I, high flow nasal oxygen is something that should be tried, but I do think, and I, I'm a big believer in the, in the p -silly, um issue with patient self-induced lung injury. And the worst combination is if you've got a patient who's working really hard, generating big, large tidal volumes, and is getting positive pressure ventilation. So whilst I think high flow nasal oxygen is fine, I think unless you're watching the patient like a hawk, the combination of non-invasive ventilation that applies yep. the positive pressure in a patient who has air hunger and who's taking big tidal volumes, their transforming pressure is massive. And I think unless you're really prepared to watch those patients so closely, um, then I think you've got to be very cautious with non-invasive ventilation. But yep. just as an aside, and just maybe just to share with the audiences, I've had some communication with um, Jan Bakker, who's at um, Columbia University in New York, and they've actually been looking at the capillary leak in these patients, in the COVID-19 patients. And he said the degree of capillary leak um, is absolutely astronomical, kind of in the, in the realms of where we've never seen it like this before. So it's just something to bear in mind that it seems that it probably is um, very much a, a, an endothelial problem as well as an epithelial problem. Correct, correct, exactly right. Thanks, Jenna. So I want to go on to um, the next panel member, Gary Martins, uh, Head of Clinical Pharmacology at, at Kretzky and UCT. Gary, uh, are you online? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you? Great. Go okay. On. So thanks, Greg. That was a real masterclass, taking me back to respiratory physiology that I've forgotten a long time ago. Um, I just want to ask the question about the hugely differing mortality rates in mechanically ventilated people. The Chinese study was shocking with almost 100% death rates, but it seems to have settled down now in the UK to around 60 to 70, in New York around 75 or so. Part of that could be triaging, part of it could be a severe epidemic in the beginning, but what do you think is driving such discrepancies? Sure, I mean, that's the million dollar question. I mean, our local experience has also been that mechanical ventilation um, has got a very poor outcome. I think that's anecdotally from, from us and, and maybe Brian wants to comment on the Tigerberg experience. Um, 
I mean, it's very, it's very difficult to um, tease it out. Um, that, that last study, which I had to breeze through at the end, which is the recent report from the mass gen. I mean, these are patients that had evolved what we would call type H ARDS. I mean, this was not type L ARDS. They had high um, elastins, you know, very poor compliance, very poor PF ratios. Most of them were prone and yet they had a 17% survival. I mean, it's very difficult to um, explain why another well-resourced American center would have such a, a big difference in mortality. And um, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what my co-panelists say, but I mean, I really think that's a, a question that's vexing public health administrators and scientists everywhere because that's the, that, that's the big answer. How do you, how do you save 17% of the patients with COVID that you ventilate? And I mean, if I may lead in from that, we don't have the resources of high income countries. Uh, ICU beds are extremely limited and normally we run by the sort of thumb suck figure, there should be a 20% mortality roughly. We know we're near that with COVID. So should we as a country be ventilating COVID patients? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, a, a good question and something that, that I think has, has been even asked in other more resourced countries. I mean, there's been a couple of editorials, um, you know, asking exactly that question. I guess, I guess, Gary, with a very wide experience globally, we have to get our own experience and then make the decisions uh, with, re, you know, with respect to that question as we go. Mm. Um, so, so, Gary, was... Anything else uh, that, that you wanted to raise? I don't think so, I, I, we might have lost you. Um, so I, the next panelist uh, that I want to turn to is, is Trevor Mguni. Uh, Trevor is the head of medicine at Kailicha Hospital in Cape Town and uh, has been involved in the front line. Uh, in, in, as we heard earlier, Kailicha, one of the communities that's uh, been heavily affected by COVID-19. And so Trevor, I uh, wanted to know from your perspective, questions for, for Greg. Thanks, Prof. Thanks for the invite. Um, again, Greg, excellent talk as usual. Um, I think, you know, for us as the, the two issues that we have, we've got the colliding sort of um, pandemics. I mean, we've got a high population. Of Greg, I wonder if we move on to Brian and we can come back to Trevor. So, okay. Trevor, if, if you don't manage to sort out your so, microphone, what I would suggest is that you... Me? Yeah, I can try again. All right, am I back? Yeah. yeah. We can hear you. Can. Please continue. Uh, sorry, I just got a thing. We, we're hearing you fine. Can you hear me, Prof? Yeah, yeah. Perfect, sorry. Apologies for that. Yeah, I mean... Um, the, the problem we have at the issue with, with us at KDH, our experience is that obviously if we've got a colliding uh, sort of pandemics with regards to communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, we still have a lot of an increased mortality with patients with chronic kidney disease, mainly from diabetes and hypertension. And when we see from the different sort of um, uh, literature from, 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 from the European cohorts, those are the patients who usually would present with, with severe disease and who have poor outcome when ventilated. On top of that, we've got the issue, obviously, with um, HIV and TB. Um, and our, obviously, population has got advanced HIV, TB. Um, and these are patients who have got virological failure um, and subsequent uh, quite a lot of opportunistic infections, um, who are, I think, you know, we don't know, we don't have any data with regards to the experience to those type of patients. But one would assume that those patients would, be, would incur higher risk and would be at risk of high, of, of high mortality as well as death. So, I mean, teasing it out from our point of view becomes quite difficult, um, especially when you're confronted with patients who um, have got low CD4 count, who are hypoxic with pulmonary infiltrates. The differential is wide, but obviously with, with, with COVID, that's something else we need to consider. So then the question begins, I mean, what is the best form of therapy for those patients? I mean, we know that patients with PCP have poor outcomes when ventilated. Um, should we have, when now we're dealing with COVID, I mean, should we take that into consideration? That's the first question. And then the next question feeds in back to what um, Prof. Martins had asked before. Um, I mean, I think in a, in a limited resource country, um, high flow nasal flow oxygen, I mean, a lot of um, sort of societies have gone against it with regards to the risk of aerosolization. Um, but I mean, in, 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 our in our country, I mean, should we really be like, afraid of it in terms of transmission? Thanks, Greg. 
Okay, well, firstly, um, if people are going to ask me impossible to answer questions, I'm not coming to this forum again. And uh, I'm not on the Ministerial Advisory Committee, so I can't explain why we aren't able to solve all the health problems of the Western Cape at the same time. But I will answer your question on high flow, because that I do know the answer to. Um, and that is that I think there's emerging evidence that the, the risk of, of, of aerosolization is completely overstated. In fact, there have been two studies. There's one in the ERJ that was, I think came out this week showing me, measuring the, 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 the distance of um, uh, aerosol deposition. And high flow is actually less than a, a conventional face mask, um, mainly because all of that high flow oxygen is directed uh, up into the nose. Apparently, it's quite important whether it you know, it's, it's positioned properly and doesn't like kind of sit to the one side. But um, I mean, cost is obviously a concern. I mean, a unit costs about 40,000 Rand and the actual disposable component, which is the, the, um, the part that delivers the humidified oxygen, which is obviously disposable um, and doesn't come into contact with the machine at all, that, that costs about 300 Rand. Um, but I mean, I think compared to the cost of, of ICU for a potentially futile, uh, you know, diagnosis and I think that we still have to um, correlate you know we have to collate our local experience but um, I don't think that that's outrageous but if, if we can keep patients out of ICU with the technology that costs that amount I think it's cost effective. Thanks Greg and, and thanks Trevor I mean I, I think you raise a lot of uh, issues that you know dealing with with uh, patients with a lot of underlying morbidities is, is going to be challenging and, and I think a lot of those things we're just going to uh, have to sort out and learn as we go as to how to manage the the, the, multi, the patients with multimorbidity and, and COVID. Um, and it, it, it's particularly challenging during the period in which they're a PUI and, and you don't know whether it is COVID or something else. And, you know, we're just going to have to share experience in that regard. So the final panel, panelist uh, that I wanted to introduce is Brian Allwood. It's, it's really great to have Brian on the panel. Brian is a colleague pulmonologist as well as a critical care specialist uh, at Tigerberg Hospital and Stellenbosch University. And as, as Greg uh, suggested, it, it would be just, if, if you can just briefly provide us with some experiences from Tigerberg uh, on some of these questions and then, and then address any questions that you have, have to, to Greg. So yeah. welcome, Brian. Thanks, Greg, and thanks everybody for the invitation. Um, it's uh, great, to be, great to be here, great, great, uh, great talk. Um, so we have had about 21 cases in, of COVID in our ICU. Uh, we've currently got nine patients in ICU, two PUIs, seven confirmed COVID, so we just charged the case this morning. Now, if you're talking about high flow nasal cannula oxygenation, we, our first six patients were all intubated and, and, um, and didn't do well at all. And so we've tried it, trying out um, high flow nasal cannula oxygenation on the patients, and all, um, all but one of our patients currently are um, on high flow oxygenation. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, we, for the same reasons as have been mentioned, we're, we're a bit hesitant with using high flow for, for the infection risks um, initially, but we've had some really nice, nice successes. And, and the interesting thing is um, that the PF ratios are double digits, so they're well less than 100 on many of these patients. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been interesting to see how they progress. Now, I'm not going to say that, that high flow nasal cannula is the panacea, and I think it's very, very early to make any assumption about one form of ventilation over the other. And I, and I very much echo what Jenna was saying about non-invasive ventilation and the transpulmonary pressures, et cetera, et cetera, um, especially with positive pressure. And the one thing about high flow nasal cannula is it, is it doesn't give you positive pressure apart from that uh, few centimeters of water, but it actually, um, uh, it's, you, you generate the pressures yourself, unlike non-invasive ventilation. Um, just to echo a couple of things that Greg said, I, I think, to highlight that this disease is a very heterogeneous disease, both in between patients, but even within the lung itself. And you'll notice from Greg's slides that, 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 that the disease initially starts out as quite patchy, and that the spectrum, this, L, this LH phenotype, is quite controversial. We definitely have seen people with good compliances, compliances over 60 centimeters of water, as Gattinoni would say, is the L phenotype. And we've also seen patients who progressed from the L to the N phenotype. I mean, sorry, to the H phenotype, and then haven't done very well, ultimately. So I think this whole disease is poking holes in the burden definition of, of ARDS, um, largely because it doesn't take compliance into account at all. Um, just, I agree with Greg that there has been some, having been at the bedside for a couple of weeks now, it's, it's very, some very interesting physiological findings in these patients. And I agree that there seems to be a, quite a strong pulmonary vascular component, 
of which the vagal plegia is a um, is one component. I think there are hypotheses which I don't think Greg had time to go to in terms of the coagulation hypothesis and there are a couple of others. And I think the striking thing for me about this whole disease is that even though there have been, what is it, 250,000 deaths worldwide, there have only been about 20 or less post-mortems done and published. And so a lot of what people are saying is based on radiology. And radiology of ground glass is could be a number of things. And, and of those um, subjects that have, have actually gone to post-mortem, we see quite a lot of edema and hemorrhage um, in these alveolar as well has been reported and not a lot of neutrophils, which is also quite surprising. And again, there's just not enough data. The question I think I have for you, Greg, and, and um, is have you guys been observing high CO2s? Because we've seen quite a number of patients with, with high CO2s on ventilators and off ventilators. And, and this is well described in the literature from all of the experience, but have, we, have you thought about this and wrestled with this at all? Because for me, this is quite a tantalizing um, hypothesis as to why some of these patients, not everybody, has quite high CO2s. Yeah, well, I, I, I can, I mean, I'll, I'd be interested to hear what Jenna uh, chips in, but there's one patient that I can think of in particular that we recently evaluated for ECMO and turned down because of age and other comorbidities who had resistant hypercapnic uh, respiratory failure with, with acidosis on a ventilator with no uh, previous um, lung disease to explain why she should have a lot of dead space ventilation um, and ultimately demised of, of you know, complications from that, but, um, you know, it wasn't a bicarbonate infusion. So yes, we have seen that. And, and I mean, I think that's unexplained. I mean, we obviously thought we'd been using too much positive pressure and too much PEEP and we'd over distended alveoli and, and created more, more dead space, but, um, um, you know, lowering the PEEP didn't really change that. I mean, Jen, I think you looked after this patient more, more, uh, recently than I did. Maybe you want to chip in. Jen, are you there? Maybe on mute. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, yes, so I think it's a pretty much a mixed bag of what we've been seeing. I haven't been in the COVID ICU this, this last week, but um, we were, one of the patients who demised we were doing our data capture for, and um, certainly the, when I was looking through all his stuff, the striking thing was that he tended to mostly have a respiratory alkalosis with a, with a low PCO2. Um, so I think, and he, he, by all the intents and purposes, looked like he was in the H type, the Gattinoni H type. Um, so I think we're seeing a bit of everything. And I agree with Greg, the one thing that struck me when I was doing the CRFs for the patients is that their, their PCO2 was lower than I'd have expected for the high amount of PEEP they were on. Whereas if you're, if you're concerning that you're over-peeping the patient and say from 20 centimeters of water, you would think that because you're going to get some com capillary compression, you're actually going to end up with a, with a higher CO2. So I was quite taken by the fact that this one patient in particular had low PACO2s, but with peeps of 20 and 22. Okay. So, um, I just, I think Mark and Wendy have one or two questions from the chat uh, before we wrap up. So do, do you want to pose them to, to Greg? So one of the questions was the role of steroids. And then in terms of the high white cell count, to comment on that. And then the other thing was ventilator outcomes relating to age as we've seen in China and how does that relate to our outcomes? I think those are sort of three questions that we maybe have time for. Okay, so let's let's take those three questions and then and then we wrap up. So, so Greg, do you? Yeah. So the, the role of steroids. Well, I mean, it's attractive to um, think about using an anti-inflammatory, and I think if you remember that slide where I showed the different phases in the pro-inflammatory phase, people have proposed using steroids. It's not currently recommended, and there is data to show that steroids for other forms of viral pneumonia are actually associated with a worse outcome. And I think until we know um, uh, where to use them, I think the potential is, is, is for harm. And I mean, I don't think it's something that, that, that we would advise. Um, I didn't quite understand the, the question about the high white cell count. Um, um, does, it does it relate to infection or does it relate to the cytokine storm? And has it has any impact in terms of outcome? Not that I'm aware. Um, 
I mean, if you look at the predictors for poor outcome on mechanical ventilation, they're usually related to comorbidity um, and to uh, length of time before intubation um, and to age. Um, the, the last question referred to uh, whether our, our experience had been the same in that uh, older patients were, were ventilated. Uh, I mean, older patients that had been ventilated did, did poorly. Um, I mean, I think we've got a fairly unofficial policy of not ventilating um, uh, patients above the age of 70 and above the age of 65 only if really no comorbidity. So I don't think that, I mean, I think we've adapted our local triage to take in some of that data. I don't, don't know if I can, uh, or having said that, I think we've got a 71 year old ventilated at the moment who's, who's, uh, who's apparently usually very fit and well and got a good baseline. But um, I mean, I think we would be reluctant to ventilate, you know, much older patients than, than the age of 70. Um, Graham, there's a, there's a comment that uh, Brian Allwood would like to make, and then before he does, uh, people have raised their hands, and I think there's an important question before we wrap up. Uh, it's come from Robert Wilkinson, and it's around the issue of pulmonary vasodilators and anticoagulation, and whether there's a role of nitric oxide. So, uh, Brian? Okay, um, well, I can answer both those questions. Yes, nitric oxide is a very tantalizing, um, tantalizing drug. It's supposed to have antiviral effects as well, as it could potentially redistribute your blood flow into the correct area, so improving your VQ. And I know of a couple of trials that are being, are, are being done. Um, the comment that I wanted to make was about, I think very important for a general audience, is about the happy hypoxic. And we've certainly seen a number of these patients and, and for, for people who maybe are not in the, 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 the high care or the critical care forum, just be careful of under assessing your, the hypoxic status of a patient because as Greg alluded to, many of these patients, although very hypoxic, are absolutely very comfortable. They'll be talking on their cell phones um, for quite a while and then there'll be a, an often, if they're going to deteriorate, will deteriorate quite, quite um, catastrophically at the end. And so for people who, as the pandemic progresses and are having to um, more generalists are looking after these patients, please be careful to assess your oxygen saturation of your patients um, quite carefully because it's quite easy to go at the foot of the bed um, to miss hypoxia. Um, and we're all familiar with this happy hypoxic term. And I think it will save lives if people are actually examining, looking at the respiratory efforts and actually looking at the hypoxia of patients. Um, so I think the message needs to get out. I think there was a question on anticoagulation as well, Brian. I don't know if you want to deal with that or I can mention it. That is um, I didn't get a chance to show those slides. Um, it's interesting that, uh, I mean, Brian was talking about the lack of good autopsy studies. I mean, Gattinoni has also published uh, uh, um, in his, one of his papers, he, he shows some microvascular thrombosis that happens in one of these patients with ARDS. And um, it's interesting because uh, sorry, with, with COVID pneumonia. And it's interesting because if you go and do a literature search on microvascular thrombosis and ARDS, he published a similar paper in 1983 talking about vascular microthrombosis in, um, in just in plain ARDS. So it's difficult to tease out how much uh, more people are just looking for this because we're using a D-dimer as a marker of a, as a predictor of poor outcome. Um, there certainly seems to be anecdotally, and there's one Dutch study showing that there's bigger, large vessel um, uh, uh, emboli, so DVTs and, and medium to large uh, pulmonary emboli. Um, but all of these strategies that people are adopting on anticoagulation based on D-dimers are largely uh, are based on expert opinion, and there's no data to guide that, and, and whether that's really helpful. Uh, whether, whether the D-dimer, I mean, there are other measures that um, uh, suggest that there's a coagulopathy that's going on, like antiphospholipid antibodies and increased fibrinogen, etc. But whether the microvascular thrombosis is, comp is uh, contributed to the gas exchange abnormality is 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 not clear. And the the one thing about the L phenotype is that the pulmonary pressures are not raised, so it does not suggest a, an, an obstructive pulmonary vascular problem. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so just to end off with, to say thank you very much to Marianne, Greg, and all the panel members. I, th I think we've had an excellent webinar uh, this afternoon. I uh, really learned a lot. Um, and to, to say to the audience that we will be back again next week, 4 to 5 p.m. On, on Wednesday next week, uh, where we will be sending the advert out. We will be having a, a, a session on COVID-19 and diabetes.
Um, so we'll send out the details uh, over the weekend about that. So thanks very much and, and uh, back to Mark and Wendy. So just thanks everybody for the participation. Just to remind you that these recordings are available on the Department of Medicine's website. They will be there by Friday. And any questions that were not addressed um, this meeting, we'll try and address them next week, particularly the role of why the Western Cape has very high numbers. Thanks very much. <laughs>